Hi, thanks for uh, coming out this early in the morning, um, making it to the first session. My name is Michael Bailey. You can find me on Twitter at Yogurt Earl. I'm an Android engineer at American Express. Be sure to check out our uh, table and booth that we have out there. We have a fun little vending machine where you tap the screen and it spits out a fun little prize. Uh, go and check that out. Also, Amex is sponsoring drinks uh, today after the, um, the conference is over. So be sure to, uh, to, the information is out there, be sure to check that out and go to that after the conference is over today. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about how layout inflator works. So you've probably, if you've done any Android development, you've probably seen something like this, where you have an on create view callback that passes you in something like a layout inflator. And you've read the documentation, it says call inflate, and uh, you get a view that you can return and use. So today we're going to be digging in a little bit deeper on how this works. Uh, most of my slides contain some code that came from AOSP looking at how the internals of layout inflator works. I've modified the code to fit on slides and omit things that we don't have time to talk about today. So let's take a few steps back. Where, what are we inflating? So if you create your UI in a layout file and you put it in res layout, you have an XML file. At build time, there's a tool called Android Asset Packaging Tool that takes the XML file that's part of your build and packages it up into a binary format that gets put into your APK that ships. This binary XML that it uses is for efficiency purposes. It can be more easily parsed and more efficiently parsed on the device. And it's not really important to know the details of this binary XML. Um, but if you are interested, uh, you can look at the details. And it's not really in the Android documentation. But if you go to uh, the framework space repo, you can see both sides of it. In AAPT, you can see how it creates this binary XML in the XML node CPP. And then on the reverse side, on the actual, so that's a build time thing with AAPT. Once it's on the device and your APK is loaded, you can see how it gets uh, read out from the binary XML at a couple of these files here, uh, the resources impl and the XML block um, dot Java, if you're interested in the details of that, uh, that binary XML format that it uses. Also, if you're more interested in the AAPT tool, there was a recent podcast episode on the Android Developer Backstage podcast. So if you don't listen to that podcast, it's worth checking out. Um, they usually go and talk with Googlers about various Android things, and they recently did an episode on AAPT. So you have an XML file. AAPT turns it into a binary XML file. Then at runtime on your device, when you inflate it, what it's doing is taking that binary XML and creating a hierarchy, a inflated view tree of Java objects on your heap structured in a tree structure. So now that you have a tree structure on your Java heap of views, and it, uh, it's inflated on your Java heap, that gets turned into pixels on the screen through a cycle uh, called the measure layout draw cycle. And those are callbacks that traverse the hierarchy of objects that now have been created on your heap. And that turns it into pixels that are drawn on the screen. We're not going to go into this much today. This is, you know, kind of happens after layout inflator does its thing. But if you're interested, there is a talk later today about this exact thing in this room at uh, 1050 by Wynn. So check that out if you want to hear more. All right. So before you can call inflate on a layout inflator, you need to obtain an instance of layout inflator. So sometimes, depending on what APR you're, API you're using, you get a callback that passes you a layout inflator. And you can just use that one, right? And assume it's the correct one. And that happens in Fragment with the onCreateView callback. 
other times, for say, let's say, for example, in an adapter that you're using with an adapter view, such as list view, you have to create your own layout inflator. There's a static method on layout inflator called from, and it takes a context. It gives you a layout inflator, then you can call inflate on it. The question here is, which context are you going to use? And in various Android APIs, it does matter which context you're going to use. Are you going to use application? Or are you going to use the activity, et cetera? Um, in this case, you're going to uh, want to use the, uh, the activity. And, and that's important because it will take the theme from that activity. So if you don't use the activity as your context for your layout in Flayer, you're not going to get the theme. Um, there's a great blog post uh, by Dave Smith about the context and all the various APIs that take context and where it's important and what the implication of using which contexts are. Um, it's, uh, you know, that could be a whole talk in and of itself, but there's a great blog post. Um, but for layout inflation purposes, you want the activity if you want your themes to work correctly. All right, so inside this layout inflator dot from method, it takes a context. Well, what does it do with the context? It goes out and calls get system service and, inflate and gets a layout inflator service, which is kind of different from most of the things that you think about getting from system service. Most of the things that you get, like audio manager, activity manager, are actually system services where you're getting an interface to something that's going outside of your process and talking to a system level thing. In the case of Layout Inflator, it's really just something that's operating within your process. Uh, but they use the same mechanism to get a, a instance of Layout Inflator. So where does Get System Service get a Layout Inflator from? Well, Layout Inflator is an abstract class, so you can't instantiate it directly. So you need something that actually implements it um, to be able to instantiate it. And what it does is there's a class called phone layout inflator, which actually doesn't have that much in it and doesn't have that much logic. It's mostly using the logic that's in layout inflator. Uh, but eventually, that gets registered as a service, and get system service looks this up. Now, phone layout inflator is not a public API. You won't see it in the documentation. It is an ASP, but it's a, it's a private implementation of layout inflator, but that by default is what you get uh, when you create a layout inflator. All right, so now you have an instance of layout inflator, and now you're going to call inflate on that instance. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the inflate method. And a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about here, um, there's more information in this, another great blog post by Dave Smith um, about some of the details of layout inflator. So check that out as well. All right, so the first argument is an int. And it's something that you might get out of uh, r.layout. Like in this case, the XML that we saw earlier, it, it was called biblebooks.xml, and it gets translated into a resource uh, integer um, that's in the R class, and that's what you would pass in to the inflate method. And it's annotated without lay at layout res so that Android Studio can warn you if you pass some other sort of integer in there. Um, because if you just pass three, it's not going to work. So it will tell you you need to pass something that came from r.layout. So what does it do with this resource uh, that you pass in? Well, it in turn calls resources.getLayout with that resource. And this activates the whole resources flow where it looks at the current configuration of your device, whether it be portrait or landscape. And it looks at all the possible um, layouts that m could match. And it picks the layout that matches your current configuration. So you may have multiple versions of the biblebooks.xml. And based on portrait or landscape, the whole resources system will go through your, uh, your layouts and pick the right one for that configuration. So that happens right in this call of resources.getLayout. So once it finds the right version based on your current configuration, it returns a parser that is now able to go through step by step through that binary XML that was put into your APK by AAPT that we saw earlier. And it returns an XML resource parser. 
and this is a subclass of XML poll parser. And then it calls an overload, uh, overloaded version of inflate that takes an XML poll, poll parser. Now, one of the interesting things about that is it actually takes an XML poll parser, but if you just pass, pass in a regular XML poll, poll parser, uh, it's not um, going to work because it actually has to be a XML poll parser that's an XML resource parser, which is a subclass. And if you don't pass that in, it eventually gets to this part of the code where it tries to cast the attribute set to an XML block, which is an implementation detail of the XML resource parser, which is the one that knows how to uh, parse the binary XML. So uh, with the default layout in Flayer, you can only load binary XML. And the implication of that is you can't just load a layout XML file from your server and try to parse it with layout inflator and inflate that. It has to be the binary XML that was packaged in your APK by a APT. All right, so that's the first parameter to inflate. The second one is a view group. So what is this view group used for? Well, let's take a step back. There's a thing in view groups called layout params. Layout params are a thing that gets set on a child view in your view hierarchy, and it tells the parent view group that it gets added to sorry for that, that how to size and position that view on the screen. But different layouts have different expectations of what types of layout parameters that you can use to size and position something on the screen. So at the very high level, view group has a layout params class. And every layout that subclasses view group, such as linear layout, generally provides its own subclass of a view group layout. So in the case of linear layout, they take what you get from view group and they add a weight to that. Because with linear layout, you can add a weight. So anytime you see something layout underscore in your XML, that's something that is going to be put into the layout params on that child view. And then it's going to be inspected by the view group that that child view gets added to and used to size and position that view as a child of that, that view group. So that's what layout params is. So you notice here that it matters which type of layout params. In this case, for linear layout, you want linear layout dot layout params if you're going to be a child of a linear layout. In some cases, this is easy. If it's explicitly in your XML where you have a text view that's a child of a linear layout, it's going to get the linear layout dot layout params, and it can just put the weight right in there. And then it can set that on the text view directly. So that case is pretty easy. But the other case is, is what if it's the top level thing in the file that you're inflating? Then it needs to know the parent so that it can know which type of layout params that it needs to create so that it can set something on there. So let's say you had some sort of layout that expected foo as one of the things that tells it how to size and position this thing. Well, it needs to know the subclass of layout params that it is going to create so that it can put foo in there. And so which type comes from this root that you pass into inflate? Because it's going to call root.generateLayoutParams, which creates the right type. So in the case of linear layout, it calls new linear layout layout params, and that's how it generates the params. So when you pass in a linear layout as the root, it calls this method and generates the right subclass of layout params. So that's why it's important to pass the view group that this thing is eventually going to be added to as a child. You want to pass that as the second parameter of inflate. So what if you just left it null? Like, I'm, don't attach it to a root for me. I'm not going to give you anything. Well, you eventually just get this default layout params, and it's not going to know about all the things that you wanted to tell it about how to size and position your thing. So it, things are going to not work the way you expect them. The third parameter is attach to root. So the second parameter is this view group that is used to determine which 
subclass of layout params you need, but with the third parameter attached to root, you can say, actually attach the thing that you just inflated, attach that to the root that I gave you for me. And it does an add child on the inflated view tree with the right params. If you say yes to attach to root, if you say no, then it, it just uses the root to inflate the layout params, um, and it doesn't attach it. It doesn't do add view on the root. So we went through the three parameters to inflate, but what about the thing that it returns? This is kind of a thing that's always been confusing and hard to remember for me, is what view is it actually returning? To me, it would be intuitive if it returned the thing that it just inflated, always. But it doesn't always just return the thing that it inflated. Depending on whether or not the thing that you inflated got attached to a root, it depend, it will, if it did get attached to a root for you, it did the add view, then it actually returns the root that it just attached to, not the thing that you just inflated. But if it doesn't attach to a root, then it returns the thing that it's just inflated. So you're either getting the thing that you just attached to, or you're getting the thing that you just inflated, depending on whether you had it inflate, which can be very confusing and surprising. So something good to keep in mind, although it's kind of hard to remember when it returns one and when it returns the other. All right, so we kind of talked about what this method actually does. Let's talk about how it actually loops through and creates this, inflates this view tree internally. So it has this recursive inflate uh, algorithm that it uses. Um, it's a fairly standard tree, tree uh, traversal. So it goes in and it starts at the top and it creates a view from the tag. So it looks at the name of the XML element at the top and then it calls into this create view from tag. So let's look at what create view from tag does. So in create view from tag, it looks at the tag name and sees that there's a dot in the tag name. Now this is a proxy for figuring out, is this a framework provided class like text view? Or is this a custom view that's part of your app and it's a fully qualified class name, com.example. whatever is in your app. Um, so in the case where there is no dot, it assumes it's something like text view. Then it goes on and it says, well, there could be multiple packages that TextView comes to. So every time it inflates something, it actually takes, uh, by default, these three package names and tries them out and see if the inflate works. So it says, oh, android.widget.textView, is that a thing? And then it tries to get the constructor and create a new instance of that thing. Well, if it's not a thing, it actually just throws a class not found exception. Um, well, in this case, I should note that Notice that we're passing into the reflective call of new instance. We're passing in a two uh, array of length two into that, which means it's calling the two parameter constructor of your view. So when layout inflator inflates your view, this is why it always calls the two parameter constructor to your view. So if, if it picked the wrong one, in the case of like text view, it actually finds it on the first try because it's going to find android.widget.textView. Dot, dot but if it can't find it, then it tries the next one, and it tries to see if there's a class called android.webkit.textView, and then it tries the third one. If it's a custom class, meaning it's a fully qualified class name, for example, something com, example, Bible view, something like that, then it just goes and gets directly gets the constructor and inflates it. It doesn't have to do this whole dance where it tries to append package names and see if it exists and inflate it. It just directly goes and reflectively creates an instance of your class. So that's what happens in create view from tag. So then we have a view that was created. The next thing it does is it, again, recursively calls itself, and it goes and creates the children of that view, and the children's children, and the children's children's children, until it's kind of gone all the way down the hierarchy and created everything underneath that view. And then once it's created everything underneath that view, it takes that view and attaches it to its parent. So this is the core algorithm of how it goes through your layout XML and forms this view tree. There's a few other things that you've probably seen inside of your 
layout XMLs that aren't strictly views. Typically, the name tag name is a view. And so there's logic inside of Layout Inflator to handle these other things that can be XML elements inside your view. So for example, include. You can do an include of another layout into your layout. And what that does is it goes out and if it sees, it calls this parse include method. And so if include is the tag name, it looks for an attribute named layout, and it goes and creates another parser for that layout. So you're, you have one parser for the top level layout. Now it's going in and creating another parser for the layout that it read off of that include tag. And then it starts the recursive inflate children thing again, and it creates a view from that tag. And eventually, Oh, you can see at the bottom there, it does group.addView. So it inflates this other layout with a separate layout parser and attaches it uh, where, to that parent in the place where that include tag was in your layout XML. Another thing it has a special path for is you can have this thing called tag in your XML, which is not a class that it needs to instantiate. But this actually adds a tag to your view. It calls set tag. And it a lot, it's different from the one where you add it as an attribute, which is just a general tag. If you want to have a key value set tag on your view, you can use this as a tag element as a child of the view you're inflating. And then it will go through and uh, call view.setTag with the key value pair that you add there. So it has to have a special parse view tag uh, for this. And there's a few other ones. One of the most interesting one being Blink. So this is in Layout Inflator. Uh, there's a thing called tag 1995 equals Blink. So you can actually add Blink in your layout and give it a subview, uh, a, a child view. And it actually has a view group that's in layout, the in layout Inflator source called Blink Layout. And what it does is it just posts periodically on a timer messages to the main thread. And it just says, you know, depending on the state, it says, you know, either draw the thing or don't draw the thing periodically. So the thing just blinks um, if you put blink in your layout XML. So that's one of the special cases they have in there. And this comment is actually from the source code. It says, let's party like it's 1995. So that's kind of inflating layouts. Now, another API that's on Layout Inflator is the ability to set factories on Layout Inflator. And this, where we saw before, where it calls the constructor for each thing, you know, it does a reflective constructor call for each thing in your layout, you can provide a factory. And so that instead, it actually just reaches out to you and calls you back and say, hey, OK, I'm ready to inflate this thing. Give me an instance of this thing. So rather than just calling the constructor on that view, it gives you the information and lets you somehow get an instance of that view and return it. Now, there was originally a factory, and then there was, so you could set factory, and then there was a set factory two, which just had one extra parameter. So it gave you the parent of the thing that was being inflated under. Um, so generally, you would want to use the factory two. There's really no reason to use the original one. And this is the logic that it goes through. So if the factory2 is there, it calls factory2 on create else. If the factory is there, it calls factory on create else. It just, um, this is simplifying, but it just calls a constructor um, and gets a new instance itself if there's no factory. So activity is actually implements layout, in fact, layout inflator factory2. And what it does is it allows you to add you know, a fragment tag. This is how f you can add a fragment tag in your layout. And then if it sees a fragment tag, it passes that information off to eventually to your fragment manager. So your fragment manager can create the fragment and call on create view on that fragment and get it back and put that into your, your hierarchy. So there's some pitfalls with setting factories. Um, by default, you can set one factory. So if anywhere in your code sets a factory, 
uh, and then you try to set another one, you're going to get an error. So if you have a library that sets a factory on your layout inflator, and then you try to set one, there can be lots of conflicts there. So factories are, uh, can be difficult to use. There's also some uh, API level bugs that you may need to work around. So in API 19, on a certain code path, in API 19 and older, in a certain code path, if you set layout and fact set factory two, it doesn't actually set factory two. It only sets factory one in this certain code path. But if you use the layout inflator compat dot set factory to set factories on your layout inflator, it has a workaround for that bug. So if you're going to use factories, I highly recommend to use layout inflator compat set factory to set the factory. Uh, because it has workaround for current bugs that are known, and I'm sure if there's more in the future that it'll be added there. So use this if you want to set a factory. And this, in this way, it has it actually has its own interface which matches factory two, so you don't have to worry about factory or factory two. The support library simplifies things if you use this method. So the support library, if you're using an app compat activity, installs its own view factory uh, using the AppCompat delegate. And the AppCompat, uh, it has a thing called AppCompat view inflator, um, which kind of serves two high level purposes. One, if it sees a text view, it actually swaps out automatically from your layout inflator AppCompat text view. So if you see, oh, I said text view my thing, and you're using AppCompat, and then you look in um, some tool that's inspecting your your view tree at runtime, you'll see app compat text view. This is how that gets swapped out, because app, app compat has a factory that swaps this out. And the reason for these subclasses is this allows um, them to do tinting um, in a way that works uh, consistency, uh, consistently across API levels. So these subclasses that they swap out for you um, do the tinting. And also, by doing their own um, view inflator, it allows them to uh, it allows AppCompat to support putting a theme directly on your view. That's also done um, via this factory that they install through AppCompat. Async layout inflator. So this is something that came fairly recently, I think, in support lib 24. So in support lib 24, there's an async layout inflator. It pretty much does the same thing as a regular layout inflator, although it's not actually a subclass of layout inflator. Um, the API is different. Essentially, what it does is that there's a singleton thread called the inflate thread internally to async layout inflator. And that thread is just used to inflate layouts. So there's one thread, so all the layouts just get inflated in a row on that single thread. And then it posts back to the main thread and calls your callback of on inflate finished. So if you have a inflation that you find is causing a performance problem and it can be loaded asynchronously, like the user could still use the UI and you don't want to block the main thread, and when this thing is inflated, it can just be added into your view hierarchy, this may be a thing to consider um, for performance reasons. Although it does complicate things because your, your thing is not going to show up on the screen and get attached to your view tree until this background thread has time to inflate it and post it to the main thread, and then it gets to the front of the main thread and is able to say, OK, here's the thing that I just inflated for you. Now you can go and attach it. So you may need to have, you make sure it works with your UI so that it makes sense where this thing just pops up all of a sudden um, asynchronously. So here are a number of the resources um, that I use, mainly AOSP, um, for a lot of stuff that I came out of this talk. So um, check these out, and that's how Layout Inflator works. <laughs>